This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 287, recorded on May 30th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today right here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How are you there, Dixon? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm just great. Excellent. Just great. Nothing could be better, Dixon. The that's, world is all in the right place. That's all I've been hearing all day from you. <laughs> <laughs> you detect a little sarcasm. A little bit. What do we have here for the weather? <clears throat> oh, you got some lovely weather outside. It's breezy. That's, that's quantitative. It's 76, I would guess, 76 degrees with partial sun and clouds. No rain in the forecast and low humidity, maybe 30%. There is rain in the forecast starting at 5 p.m. I don't want to hear this. 30% <laughs> chance, but it's 22C right now, which was like 74 or something like that. Yeah, that's right. It's a bit dark outside, Dixon. I think it's perfect. Dixon, let's get some other guests on this show. What do you that think? That sounds like a great host, idea. Hosts and guests. A wonderful idea. Joining us from... Oh, I don't have it written here. <laughs> well, uh, you could add lib. <laughs> You're good at this. Wait now. a minute. Let me see if I remember. Oh, I'm going to look it up on uh -oh. the last podcast. 285. Would that have been the last one? I can't no, do 286. No, 284. No, 286 was in... Uh, Boston. Okay. 280. How about 283? Here we go. Hmm. Southeast. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> how come it's not on the episode? I don't know. Yeah, joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, I got to write it. Southeastern. And you know, I, I, I used it for uh, Michelle Swanson because mm -hmm. you guys are in the same place. How are you, Kathy? I'm fine. And the weather here is gorgeous. Yeah. 75 degrees, wow. which is 24 Celsius. Not a cloud in the sky. Uh, uh, yeah, just fabulous. And it's cool at night in the nice. low 50s at night. Nice, Great night. sleeping yeah. weather. Uh, yeah, excellent. And the undergrads are gone, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Ann Arbor is a sleepy little Midwestern town now, right? There's still a lot going on, but oh, yeah. yeah. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Back from your long trip to Boston. Yes, yes, all the way. Actually, it was kind of a long trip back. A lot of traffic? Yeah, Mass Pike was all backed up for mm. no obvious reason. I'm sorry about but that's, that. But that's kind of, you know, redundant. You know, Mass Pike is always backed up one way or the other. Hmm. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fairly nice weather. It's supposed to cloud up and rain eventually today, and it's kind of clouding up but not raining yet. And uh, hmm. it's pretty much the same stuff you've got, 72 Fahrenheit, 22C. There you go. I have a guest today back for the umpteenth time, the most frequent guest we've ever had on <laughs> He's been Twiv. on there more than I have. <laughs> the Steve Martin of Twiv. Well, Dixon, <laughs> that is only your doing. Yeah, I know, I know. I just said that as a joke. <laughs> Actually, I have been on here quite a while. You have been, but you're not a guest. You're a co-host. No, that's it's a doctor. From uh, the University of Maryland in Baltimore, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Matt Freeman. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Hey, Matt. Why do we have you so much? Besides the possibility that we like you, but... Is I it think there must be some other M in your email list. You keep clicking by accident and I end up there. <laughs> Could it be that coronaviruses are always in the news? Huh. Well, it has been... The, the MERS has been the, uh, the big story lately, so we're, uh, it keeps us busy. Hmm. Hmm. I think that must, uh, that must be it. You think? Mm -hmm. It has to be. So I don't know what the count is, but you've been here a lot, and we appreciate it. Sure. More than happy to. <clears throat> how's, how's your uh, lab? You got tenured yet? <laughs> no, Jesus! No, you don't ask people no pressure. Those questions on the Why air. Why not? He's been on Twiv ten times. I can ask yeah, him that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'll see if my dean uh, takes that into account. Um, <laughs> no tenure. Uh, the lab's going great. We are uh, pushing ahead. We have a lot of really cool MERS work going on. Um, publishing a couple papers recently and uh, pushing out some grants. So we uh, everything's going good. The lab's working really well. I'm really happy with how things are working out. Love it. So, do you do any work on SARS coronavirus at all? Absolutely, yeah. We still have a full SARS project, and everybody's picked up MERS kind of on the side, or we have one or two people working on MERS full time. So uh, it's it's been busy, but good. Well, one of the papers uh, I've got on the list today says that you shouldn't work on SARS anymore. <laughs> That's I, right. I saw that, and I, we'll get to exactly. that. I'd like to hear your opinion. 
Sure. But first, we wanted let, let's do some follow ups here. Um, I have two. All doing with last week's episode, which was in Boston, and our guests, Julie Pfeiffer and Paul Dupre. Uh, Wink writes, It just occurred to me while listening to you jogging, which isn't quite correctly constructed, but it's okay. I'm not jogging right now. (laughs) That the disposition of human stool is changed when you are paralyzed. Love Twix, in capital letters. I don't know why he thought of this while he was jogging. I guess he was listening. So I guess when you're paralyzed, he's saying this, something changes with the stool, which is related to what Julie Pfeiffer was said, saying, I guess, because polio is interacting with the gut microbiome, hmm. maybe. Hmm. Well, and also, I guess, um, uh, the way the human stool gets away from the body may change when you're paralyzed. It certainly could. You're not going to get up and walk to the toilet. What does disposition mean? I don't know. Yeah, it could mean a number of things. It maybe it changes peristalsis in some way. Changes maybe the, the stool gets angrier. Yeah, right. So anyone know what is? I, don't, I hadn't heard that before, but Perhaps I could imagine the, it. Microbial composition of the microbiome might change. Might change. Yes. Okay, Mark writes. Mark is our friend who uh, has written many times before. Hello, Vincent, and this week's hosts in attendance. Late afternoon this past Memorial Day, in an unusually warm afternoon while visiting California's central coast, I was engaging in a new pleasant activity, listening to TWIV while tending a barbecue. (laughs) The new part was listening while cooking food on the grill. This joins listening while driving and listening while dog walking as favorite enjoyable listening venues. My iPhone was playing TWIV 286 recorded at ASM Boston. While listening, I was enjoying the waste product of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and grape juice aged (laughs) in a French oak barrel. In other words, a fine California Cabernet. From earbuds flowed conversation with the second guest of the episode, a discussion with Dr. Julie Pfeiffer about her research on poliovirus. An interesting recurring theme developed she invites colleagues for drinks on her patio to talk science different aspects of her work in the podcast conversation referred to conversations on that patio this triggered an idea how about a twix drinking game Uh oh it is modeled after bingo and the board is constructed of catchphrases commonly uttered by different hosts on twiv twip and twim (laughs) how many times have twiv listeners heard ferrets are not humans or twim listeners heard Chamber of Commerce weather. These and other phrases are familiar friends to listeners. Now they can be part of a game. Attached is a PDF file with a bingo card (laughs) with 25 common phrases I've heard in all the shows. To play, get a glass and adult beverage and start listening. Every time a phrase is used, take a drink and mark the card. (laughs) Listeners can personalize the game by substituting some of their favorite phrases in lieu of mine. It also is attached as a smaller image of the board suitable for embedding in a blog post. It's funny. Please keep recording shows from conferences and visits to other researchers' labs. Hearing researchers talk about their work adds a dimension that interpretation and discussion of published papers can't match. <laughs> so, Well, Mark, all I have to say about this is that it's a lot of math, but it's good to be here. It's, it's really <laughs> good to have you, Alan. How are those stumps, uh, Alan? <laughs> oh, the stumps, yeah, the stump grinders. Oh, stump grinders should be on the bingo card, shouldn't they? Yeah. Just looking at this, trying to hit Norwalk. as many as I can. I mean, they would just come up with the word Norwalk, Norwalk. and that would be Norwalk. the end. Norwalk, end. Be- Norwalk <laughs> Connecticut, right? That's and right. Story Arc. Story Arc yes. is one. But Dixon, you're so Safe many. Crackers. That's, that's uh, safe Crackers one. would be good. But you don't say it much because you're not here. That's Well, actually, you, you know, to, to do this game properly, you would have to generate multiple cards because if everybody's playing with yeah. the same card, that's then right, you're going right, to all win at the same time. It's called Twix Bingo. Yes. Nice. Or you could play yeah. it like Jeopardy. Whoever got their first wins. Since, yeah. she, since she was haploid. I like that. Dear Twivome. <laughs> Hiya, fellows. Is that Rich Condit? Yeah. Yes. That's Rich. <laughs> A lot of math. <laughs> Plaque essay. Plaque essay. It's cute. Thank you, Mark. Yep. A true fan. Exactly. Okay. And I think Kathy just posted a link that explains the previous email, maybe in too much detail. Yeah. <laughs> about human stool and paralysis. Christopher Reeve, huh? Yeah, it's a sight. Too much information. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I thought we'd have you on. Um, who do we have on anyway? <laughs> Matt. <laughs> Matt. 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 <laughs> I'm just on. kidding. We have to bring us up to date on uh, what's going on in the world of MERS, sure. coronavirus. We know it's kind of fizzling out, but we just wanted you to tell us that. 
<laughs> yeah. It is not fizzling out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I hope it is. It's forever all, uh, for every, everything being good, I'm glad it is. Hopefully it is fizzing out, but I don't think it is. Uh, it hasn't shown to be really dramatically slowing down of late. So in the Middle East, it's actually increased recently. Is that true, or is it just more sampling? So it's a, that's a, I think it's a good question that no one really understands at the moment. Um, I think that there, there are clear reports of more sampling um, and, and broader sampling across multiple contacts and, and broader contact sampling of, of people around the infected cases. Um, and there's other reports that know it's really a spreading in hospitals and there's, there's more uh, issues with containment in hospitals and in and healthcare settings. So uh, both are probably true. And uh, the real numbers are somewhere, you know, that either way, we know that there's more cases. That's all that really matters is that um, we know there's a lot more cases of both people that are symptomatic, a lot more that are asymptomatic. Um, and if it was really just sampling bias, you would think that the case fatality rate would dramatically drop, and it really hasn't at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, the case fatality well, rate the sampling, is around. The sampling is being done um, in a biased manner. Because you're yes. going to the people yes. who are going to be sampled are going to be people who come to medical attention, right? Right. So to be the uh, from what I remember from the Minister of Health, in the the to be sampled, you have to have before it was you had to have pneumonia, and that's when they sampled you in the hospital. And now it was any respiratory disease um, that was seen in the hospitals. And then they've been doing a certain number of contact cases around the around the people that are that were um, positive. And okay, so, so yeah, yeah, we would we would see a drop in the case fatality rate if there was if it was a huge difference in sampling. Right. So I think all, all of that together just I mean it just means that it's a little more worrying. And now there's spread of the virus to uh, a couple additional countries, including the United States and Iran. Um, now two cases in Iraq. Um, I think the last time we called, it's it's now it, it, since I've been on. There's 12 countries now, in total. So it's really um, hmm. it it has been spreading, and it's the worry, of, especially of the cases that came to the U.S. is all it takes is somebody to be sick and get on a plane and fly to another place. And yep. um, if they either don't know they're infected before they leave, or they have a mild cold and they don't think about it, um, they can then bring the virus with them to a new place that hasn't that at least hasn't seen it yet. Now, you say spreading. Um, in the case of the two U.S. cases, these are people who got it in the Middle East and then showed up here and symptoms developed here. Correct. Right. But so in, the, the, in right. some of the other Middle Eastern cases, it, it, has it actually spread to the country in the epidemiological sense? So, mo no. So, well, most of the cases in the Middle East are, um, are primary cases. Uh, especially Saudi Arabia, UAE, Jordan, Qatar. Some of right. those are people who went through Saudi Arabia and then went home again uh, on a, for travel or for business. Um, uh, but uh, even in those circumstances, there is still very few chains of infection, at least that have been proven epidemiologically. Uh, right. The, there are usually one to one cases or maybe one you know one maybe two people's two people spread, but um, right. most of the time it's only a single spread. So the virus is not yet uh, been shown to be able to um, spread dramatic dramatically from, from in large groups of people like SARS did, which was one of the issues when um, when SARS emerged. So uh, there is no massive super spreading event that's really causing a lot of problem. Um, there are there are hospital containment issues, which is a big problem in in both uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and um, those are hopefully being taken under control now. And um, the WHO is playing a bigger part and trying to help with those type of uh, regulations. I found a neat map called coronamap.com, which displays uh, globally all the cases. Mm -hmm. It gives you a daily number of infected, died, case fatality rate, which is nice that they get the right name. And then, right. then all the mm -hmm. cities, and you can click on them and see how many people have died. So MERS behaves basically the same way that H5N1 behaves. In what sense, Dixon? That there's no person-to-person -person transmission. It's a contact between a human and an infected animal. Oh, no, there is, there's that, there is definitely person-to-person -person transmission. It, there just isn't long chains of transmission that have been found. So do you know why that might be then? I think that's a very good question that uh, I don't think anyone knows. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't go very far. It goes one, maybe two people, healthcare or family, right? Right. And it stops. And right. what do they pick up from the camel that they then spread 
to other people. Mm-hmm. Is it a is it a salivary thing? Do you think, or is it a? So it's another really good question, and uh, I know there are groups out there trying to figure that out. Um, right. okay. uh, we know that nasal swabs can be positive, um, uh, and and kind of respiratory secretions can be positive in the camels. Right. We don't know anything else at the moment. Um, as far as I know, I, don't, I haven't seen a report of of camel milk or camel meat being um, actually positive for a virus. Uh, it's something that uh, people mm-hmm. are investigating. Sure. Um, but uh, the, that's one of the possibilities. And there's actually warnings out in Saudi Arabia now to try to minimize the contact with unpasteurized milk and meat. But from what I understand from people that live there, um, that unpasteurized milk is basically a staple of uh, unpasteurized camel milk. Is a staple of you know kids eating and 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 people I mean people drinking all the time in Saudi Arabia and throughout the yeah, Middle East. Yeah. So that's really not I think of while we can say don't do it um, uh, coming from the outside doesn't really help. It has to be people in the inside that are trusted um, and uh, all of the the countrymen that are there in country believe him. And camels are not dying from this. I take it. No, there are no reports of camel deaths due to this at all. Interesting because H five N one kills birds. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So I've heard from a couple um, um, veterinarians in the Middle East that uh, some of their camels that they've found to be positive uh, may have some respiratory symptoms early on, and then it resolves, and that's it. So um, basically a snotty camel. No. (laughs) Uh, I also hear they're looking at camel urine just to see if there's any virus there. Right, exactly. Do you think that's likely, Matt, that you'd find it there? I don't know. I, there's the the only connection with that in in people is there's the one case in um, in Germany where the well, that was the one of the basically the, that original camel uh, handler who um, from very early on in the in the outbreak he um, was caring for a sick camel and then got sick himself flew flew to um, Marburg Germany for treatment and ended up dying there but they had urine that was positive from him in um, I believe it was Kristen Drosten's lab. Um, Mm. Uh, that was PCR positive for MERS. So the, the potentially it's, it can be shed um, in urine as well in yeah. camels, but yeah. there's really there's no data on that right now. The doctors in Marburg must have been a little freaked out by them <laughs> because of their experience with the Marburg virus. You would, you would think. There's a, I'm sure there was an, an, ID, uh, um, <laughs> an ID fellow there yeah. kind of either really excited or really scared. All I was time. in Marburg a year after that outbreak, and... Uh, I went to visit Herxt, and um, it was quite an interesting take on on animal-borne infections in experimental situations like that. There's this one paper in uh, Merging Infectious Diseases where they, uh, and this is from Drosten's lab also, they had a case of uh, MERS um, in Saudi Arabia where this young man had been caring for sick camels three days a week, and he... um, he was uh, applying herbal remedies to their snouts and nostrils. Good Lord. Three times a week. And then uh, got sick, and then they, they isolated virus from him and from the camel, or at least PCR material, hmm. and showed that the sequence is consistent with one being the source or the other. So, Matt, with uh, the increase in the surveillance, at least, to people who might not have been sick but living in the area... Uh, do you think the case, the fatality rate, forget the case fatality, just the total fatality rate over a number of people infected will go down? I mean, I think we better hope it goes down. Um, if, it, if it keeps staying where it is or goes higher, we're all in trouble. So I would agree. Uh, I think that, I mean, I think all, over time it definitely will go down. Um, the question is how much, how many more cases till that mm-hmm. those kind of um, trends happen. And but, but so far, Matt, the... With the increased surveillance, they are picking up now asymptomatic uh, PCR-positive individuals. Is that correct? Right, exactly. Right. Which we had before as well, but now we have more of them. Exactly. Now, in the U.S., there was a case in Florida, right? And the other was Indiana? Right. And then mm-hmm. they thought that the Indiana person had passed it to someone else, but that turned out to be a false positive, right? Right, exactly. So the, the first case was Indiana, the second case was Florida, but um, the... Yes, both. But the interesting thing about those cases, I think, is both were people from Saudi Arabia that had traveled to the U.S. Hmm. Um, uh, as far as I understand, they both were healthcare workers working in Saudi Arabia that had been that traveled to the U.S. to visit family. And um, one wasn't sick. One kind of got symptoms along the way, supposedly. Um, 
And then when they came to the U.S., they got sicker and then went to the hospital and they were tested, um, especially based on their history of being in, in the Middle East. Mm. Um, and it was that Indiana case where there was a lot of worry because he had a business meeting with um, a man in Illinois and uh, after two meetings, when they initially tested, they, they started testing all the contacts of this guy from Indiana. And after two um, uh after two business meetings, this they tested this guy, and and he ended up being uh, from the story it, from the data, it's PCR negative. But they took blood as well, and by immunofluorescence assay and by um, ELISA, he was positive. But when they did a neutralization assay, he was negative. So they think it was just a false positive mm-hmm. on the initial screening. Um, but that would have been the first transmission event uh, in the U.S. Except. Actually, WHO wouldn't have called it a transmission event because it was only antibody positive and not virus positive, so mm. that doesn't count. Mm. And both of those U.S. individuals recovered, right? Right, exactly. Mm. And since then, it's been a couple of weeks ago now, mm-hmm. there have been no other reported isolations in the U.S., right? Right, no, no, um, no other cases that, that have been reported, at least. Have they been... I presume they've been continuing to test people who had contact with those individuals. Right. As far as I know, they, they've gone through all their testing and everybody's negative. All the follow-up uh, in the initial, in the Florida case and the Indiana case, the hospital workers who dealt with the patients early on um, before they knew they were MERS positive, they were all quarantined and, um, and sent home. And so their 14-day quarantine has been over and they have been sent back to work. Um, there have been no clear. other further PCR positive individuals there. No, not that they found. No, so I know there was a lot of work on all the um, on all of the planes they took as well. Mm-hmm. So finding the people who sat next to them and near them, and on the planes to try to track down mm-hmm. um, as many uh, other contacts as possible. But the Florida case, it was um, Saudi Arabia to Orlando, uh, with a stop in London, Boston, and Atlanta along the way. So. That's a lot of context that they were trying to connect the dots with. Man, I hope that was a cheap ticket. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but the SIDRAP says almost all the travelers who are on airline flights with the two men have now been tested. Right. Mm. Wow, that's a lot of work. Oh. Yes, so the CDC got on on everything pretty fast and uh, and HHS and and really, um, I think, ran with it, so which is is good. I mean, they did what we would want them to do. Do do. Did they? Did these two healthcare workers ha, had they worked with the MERS patients in Saudi Arabia? Uh, both were at hospitals where there were MERS patients. Mm-hmm. Um, from all of the literature I've seen, I haven't seen whether they actually dealt with patients directly. Um, that was did never, they deal with camels directly? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did they deal with camels directly? Right. So again, all of that is. Uh, I think is important follow up and and all of this kind of case study issues where of looking at contacts and did how much animal contact was per with patients and um, and do they live on farms are they in cities are they around other people that are positive those kind of things are need to be done and and hopefully are in the progress of being done in in Saudi Arabia and 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 other Middle East countries where there's cases now we keep seeing this um, it if this has been going on for a while, and, and it's a lot of primary cases and an occasional secondary case. This is a virus that's jumping from apparently camels into people and doing it again and again and occasionally into another person. It, it seems like it's just not quite catching on in people. Um, at what point does that change? Or does it? Mm-hmm. I, I that's if you had if I had a crystal ball, uh, I could maybe <laughs> yes. tell the future. But, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly what Ian Lipkin said. <laughs> Isn't that like I writing a grant? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he was asked at ASM, "Is this the next pandemic?" And he said, "I right. don't have a crystal ball." Right. I mean, there's there's uh, I don't know if it's good or bad that I use the same word as Ian, um, but I think that I the longer it goes without catching on, the better. Um, sure. Yeah. I think the worry in general, on to me, is that. Um, there seems to be a lot of spread. The, 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 the lethal cases are in people who have other comorbidities. So right. um, as we know from all of our work in the labs, the mm-hmm. um, viruses grow better in, in animals that are, um, have reduced immune responses to anything, whether it's innate response or adaptive response. And if you are replicating more and more in um, people with other comorbidities, you have a much broader chance of um, getting higher titer virus 
uh, which leads to more mutations, which leads to sure. um, a larger population of quasi-species and swarm of virus that, uh, that potentially can mutate to the point where it can actually accrue the mutations that you want to, um, that you want, that, that will allow for greater person-to-person -person spread. So um, uh, I think that that's a big worry is the longer it stays around, the, you know, the scarier it is to me, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with the SARS outbreak that happened. Why hasn't there been another big resurgence of SARS? And, you know, have we not completely understood its transmission cycle and its host range? Well, so SARS is, SARS is um, it, we actually learned a lot from SAR, for, uh, about SARS now that we can apply to MERS. And I think there's two important differences that um, have been very um, uh, important for infection control. Mm -hmm. The first is that the reservoir for SARS was in the civet cats and raccoon dogs in the wet markets. The Chinese government recognized that very early on, and they... They took out all of the. They, they killed all all the civet cats and raccoon dogs that were in the wet markets, and they they blocked the import of any of them of those animals into uh, into the markets, into the cities, and you weren't allowed to sell them. You weren't allowed to cook them in restaurants. You weren't allowed to buy them at all. So you blocked the reservoir completely, for that was spreading it to people, and then for everyone that was infected, you could quarantine them. And uh, they blocked air travel and they blocked all the infected cases by either quarantining them or keeping people at home, putting them in the hospital. And really between blocking the reservoir and blocking the um, – and doing very, very tight infection control procedures in the hospitals, mm. you were able to block the spread of the virus and, um, okay. and then it essentially eliminated itself because you blocked that, um, the possibility of it spreading. It's the, the parent virus of SARS is still in bats in China. Um, right. But obviously, the bat to human interaction is much less than sure. uh, you know civet to human or camel to human. So for SARS, that was fine. For MERS, the fact that it's in camels uh, makes it problematic to 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 quarantine a reservoir when um, camels are such a important part of the Middle Eastern culture, um, and there's no way you're going to cull camels in Saudi Arabia. It's just not right. going to happen. Right. So. You can't do the reservoir control that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and the infection control procedures have been problematic as well. And I think they're getting better. And with a lot of extra, with uh, some help from the outside, they're getting better as well. But I think that's a problem. And when you have a lot of community based hospitals that may not have the same um, standards of, of quarantine and infection control that we would, that we would want, um, the, you, you will basically allow for those hospital spreads to occur. And so between the two, it's hard to control at the moment. So, Matt, in other countries, there have been uh, MERS-positive camels, right? Egypt, right. apparently, some camels from Sudan and Ethiopia. But there have been no human infections in, right. in those countries. Do we understand why? No, we don't. I think it's a really interesting question, too. I, I, don't, I, I think that's – to me, that's actually one of the more interesting questions is, is why is it Saudi Arabia as this large cluster of cases – um, why not UAE? Why not Jordan? Why not Egypt? Um, why not Oman? Where there, where there is positive camels, why aren't we seeing this larger surge of cases that are there? Um, some people in Saudi Arabia would say it's because they're not testing enough and they're, they're there, but they just don't know. Is it the uh, same exact genotype? There, it, it's very similar, actually. The, there, isn't very, there isn't a dramatic difference in the... Um, in the sequence from the viruses, uh, hmm. there, I mean, there are mutations, um, but there it's not dramatic. They're not dramatically um, dramatic strain differences between all these viruses. I mean, the camel viruses are very similar to the human cases. You can find clades if you look um, if you do the right analysis by um, phylogenetically, but there really are not dramatic mm -hmm. differences, which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. And and I don't think um, at least in all the data that I've seen so far, I don't I can't explain why. The clusters are in one place and not the other. So I have to tell you, last night I was at, in a rehearsal break and people on either side of me saw me looking at these MERS papers and they said, is this really a big <laughs> deal for us? And so then we started talking a little bit more about, well, you know, maybe measles is more of a concern because of people not getting vaccinated. I mean, just the total number of cases and, you know, for us, the geogra geographic remoteness and, and so forth. Um, 
you know, and I even said, uh, and one of them asked about dengue on the eve of the World Cup, you know, and I said, right. <laughs> yeah, it seems like there might be things with a bigger potential for us to worry about if you wanted to worry about viruses. So Meningitis. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Ian Lipkin was asked that, and he said he worries about dengue, chikungunya was another mm-hmm. one. Chikungunya is on the rise. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, but it's vector-borne. Matt, also in. I mean, as far as we can tell, the virus has been in camels in Saudi Arabia since the 90s, but human infections only started recently. That's another conundrum, right? Well, did they? Mm. Yeah, who knows? Right. We started picking it up, right? Why did we start seeing it? I mean, people get very sick, and could have, we could have diagnosed it 10 years ago, I would think, right? Well, I, I mean, you could have diagnosed it as what? Well, I mean, we've had we've had diagnostic capabilities for a while now, not just in the past two years, right? You could have done PCR deep sequencing. Well, I we so at my at my the hospital that I'm affiliated with uh, the um, the microbiology lab there runs a respiratory panel for every uh, sample that the doctors want, mm-hmm. and every month I get a list of the um, of the samples that are positive for different flu and RSV and um, and metanumavirus, and hmm. and there's about a thirty percent uh, number every month that is that comes up negative on all the screens. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. And so some of those are patients that really didn't need to be tested in the first place, mm-hmm. and some of them may be things that are there, but we don't know. And and the capabilities <laughs> of following up every one of those cases is really really minimal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that number of respiratory diseases that are unaccounted for sounds like it's always been that way yeah. to me. I mean, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those could have been bacterial. They could have been other things, and um, and we don't know what they are. And so I think that 20 years ago, this may, if this happened then, it may have just been an odd outbreak of um, lethal respiratory disease or you know uh, mm-hmm. pneumonia mm-hmm. and chalked up as that, and that was it. And so well, or not even, does. not even, maybe not even an outbreak. Sure, sure, exactly. yeah. Because these are, uh, as there, we, yeah. as you pointed out, these are in most cases the ones who are dying are patients who are sick with other things. Yeah, yeah. And right. Um, right. you know, patient goes to the hospital, gets sick, gets sicker, and dies, and that's that. So you, so we, you're saying, Matt, we got lucky and found a virus in one of these cases, and because of that, now we're alert for it. Mm. Absolutely right. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, Lyme. I think dis- it, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. Lyme disease in the United States was exactly like that until right. this woman with those children got on her horse and decided to do something. There were lots of cases before that. They just dismissed them as other things. So you could go back to old Sierra, Matt, and test that idea and see if there's seropositivity in people going way, way back. Sure, absolutely. And, um, you know, we need to be in a place where those samples are available, and, um, you know, Saudi Arabia seems to be the place to do that. But I think that, I think all those studies are, are I, I think those are all amazing science questions. And, um, I mean, that's why we do what we do, because that's... Uh, those are the type of things that we want to be able to study. And mm. um, with new technologies, we can do that, which is, I think, great. Yeah. So you po- you put a couple of papers in the show notes here about therapeutics. Can you tell us about those? Sure. Uh, there's been a, a, a bit of a, a bunch of papers that have been published recently on, um, on different drugs that have been shown to be useful, uh, at least in the lab. And so... Um, one of them is from a group in, uh, so two of them are, one of them is our paper and one of them is a group from um, uh, this thing called the Silver Consortium in, in Europe. Uh, the last author there is Eric Snyder. Um, and our paper was done with um, help from a company called Zalicus and uh, USAMRID and uh, the um, Integrated Research Facility, the IRF at uh, Fort Detrick, which is an NIAD lab. You had uh, Jens Kuhn mm-hmm. um, on, so he's there. Um, so he's at the same facility. And so both of us, uh, our group and, and uh, the other paper from Eric Snyder's group, screened a bunch of um, a, a subset of FDA-approved compounds for their ability to inhibit MERS and SARS. And they did 229E, another human coronavirus, um, in their paper. And so both of us found basically um, a, a subset of FDA-approved drugs that can potentially re- be repurposed for um, the fight against MERS. And so uh, we're now working up those lists and looking for mechanisms of action studies and doing mechanisms of action studies and uh, testing them in animal models to see um, if they do protect against SARS and, uh, and MERS. Um, so what do they have to go through before they could be used in people? For, so they have to go through, uh, basically, FDA, they wouldn't have to be fully FDA approved again, but they have to get an, off, an a, um, alternative use uh, license. Mm-hmm. Um, but only if you want to advertise them for this use. 
Correct. Right. Because exactly. any any physician can prescribe any FDA approved drug to any patient. Right. If if we had if we had um, or hopefully once we get uh, data showing that these work that that a certain drug combination or single drugs works against uh, MERS or SARS or any coronavirus, uh, um, we'll be in contact. Um, uh, where we would be in contact with the the countries of the Middle East to let them know um, right. that this is a potential combination that would work. Has anybody ever tried to use serum from asymptomatic positives to save the life of someone in dire straits? So that's that was actually the that's the first thing that people use um, for these cases, sure, and so okay. there is uh, that is some, um, a preparation that is being proposed uh, for use in the Middle East. I'm not certain if it's been used in a in in a patient yet, mm. um, but they um, mm. but that is being proposed, uh, and there's a, a bunch of other. Um, companies who have uh, monoclonals and polyclonal sera that they're sure. they'd like to be used um, as therapeutics as well, mm -hmm. um, and we're working with some of those to test them out in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other drugs as well. So there's another paper um, looking at a helicase inhibitor. We helped with a little bit of that study, um, uh, and that paper is actually in the same issue as our uh, as the other two FDA um, approved compound papers, um, and. That was um, with Stefan uh, Serafianos uh, at the University of Missouri. And then uh, there's another one that just came out recently this week, which I think is really interesting. It's from uh, a group. The last author on the paper is uh, Volker Thiel. And in this one, they found um, – or sorry, the last author is Ed uh, Trabala, but Volker is the second last author. They're co-last. Um, and they found a drug that affects – coronavirus specifically. So one of the things that coronas do during replication is they set up these things that are called double membrane vesicles. So it looks like a vesicle, but it has two, two membranes on it. And that's where the replication machinery sets up shop and starts pumping out um, viral RNA and uh, to be made into virions and to make um, uh, coronavirus proteins with. And this, these drugs, the drug that they found in the screen uh, affects that structure. So hmm. Hmm. They, it's actually so it's really nice and specific. It's only been tested in vitro, but um, they found mechanism. They know exactly. They made escape mutants, so they know what protein in the virus is is affected by the drug and what or what it interacts with. So it's actually a really beautiful study of um, of what we can do in the lab to kind of go from knowledge about a vi of the coronavirus to getting drugs that target that um, that directly. So uh, that's another paper that came out in Plus Pathogens this week. Right, so that's open access, and I was just going to point out that in the article in The Scientist, they said that the workers had been working on something for the, uh, I think, 229E, and they were about to publish, and then stuff with MERS came out, so then they tested it with MERS and SARS um, and found that it worked for those two. I think that was the order of it, but anyway, right. it's kind of neat that um, they were able to show it working on several different viruses. This is what happens when you let scientists do what they want to do. <laughs> right? Right. right. It's no it, doesn't said, no always, it doesn't always work out this way, but it's nice <laughs> that, uh, that in this case it did. Now, well, right. for you, Matt, if this virus hadn't emerged, you'd be working on SARS, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, so we, what, what do you think? Yeah. Is that, do, you, do you find that interesting that this popped up and now you're working on it big time? Uh, I, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course it's interesting. I think that, um, I mean, it's... I think that that's what why we do what we do. Um, I think the more knowledge we can find about the virus and the models and that we work on, even if you know you consider SARS an extinct virus, kind of, um, the the better we are prepared for the next type of uh, outbreak for this something in the same virus family or that affects the same pathways. I mean, it doesn't have to be the drugs that we're finding. Um, they're actually going. I believe they're going to work against multiple other virus families. We just didn't know that these drugs did it before. Mm, right. And um, so, the, I mean, for our, for our work, I think the, the kind of really nice thing about it is that we now have compounds that are able to inhibit SARS and MERS, um, but we don't know how. Mm, and mm, so mm. it gives us a lot of space to now say, well, what is the actual target of this drug? Why, if we, when we figure out the target, then we can understand or try to understand why the virus uses that target during replication and why does inhibiting or, or activating or whatever this pro these drugs are doing to that, that protein do to uh, affect replication of SARS and MERS and, and potentially other viruses as well? So um, there's a lot of 
there, I mean, once we get past uh, the translating this into a therapy, there's a lot of basic science virology that is going to be done on these compounds yeah, that sure. uh, I'm really looking forward to figuring it out. So, Matt, do all these uh, coronaviruses use the same double membrane structures for the replication site? Yeah, exactly. All, okay. all coronas do, yeah. So then uh, any new coronavirus that pops up, these drugs would come right into play then, wouldn't they? Right. So this, the one from the, the last paper from that, that targets the DMVs, uh, that definitely would, I mean, that potentially could be used for other ones as well. I, I, there, there could be different susceptibilities to, these, to the same this sure. one drug by sure. other coronas. Sure. But, um, but you would think that if it does, if it does alter the structure, mm -hmm. then an interaction between the viral protein to induce the structure, then it should work on other coronas as well. Um, and it, you know, once we can, uh, I don't, in the paper, there's no animal work, but um, you know, getting into animals and start tweaking the structures to, to get the right, um, the right formulation that'll work in, 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 in both animals and humans, I think is obviously the next step they're going to take. And uh, I think that, that pushing that forward is where this, you know, all of the, all of this work needs to go is, sure. is getting it uh, tested in, in animal models of disease, whether it's SARS, whether it's MERS, whether it's 229E, mm -hmm. whether it's flu, whatever it is, um, all of those can be done and, and I think should be. And, and it's, I think, a good avenue to take to figure out how these work, where they work, and why they work. For MERS, Remind where would you put, uh, what animal would you put it in? Ah, Fer ferrets. So, <laughs> not ferrets. Um, because ferrets lie. Uh, no, mice lie. What is it, ferrets? Monkeys ferrets are not people. Check, yeah, check ferrets the bingo card. Yeah, yeah. Check the bingo card. I don't know. What I does gotta, Paul I, Simon I, say? I print out the bingo card. I want to hit all of them today. Um, exactly. I think that, um, so the, the models so far that we know are rhesus macaque replicate MERS. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Mice do not. Uh, rhesus come down with kind of a mild to moderate disease. <clears throat> um, and uh, Try gerds. Excuse me? Gerds. Jerds are native to the area. Jerds? Jerds. J I R D S. Jerds. Okay, Vincent, what's a jerd? <laughs> oh, a it's a rodent. cute little rodent. Yeah, it's a little rodent that it's includes a the Middle gerbil. East, Middle Eastern rodent that's yeah. used for lots of studies in uh, filariasis and leishmaniasis. Yeah, but, they're cute. Uh, Very they're cute. cute and they're available and they're, they are desert animals just like the uh, camels. I, I'm writing that down. I, I've not heard that as a, a good oh, lab model, but I will try hey, then. to get go a for it. Go for it. Marionis, <laughs> Marionis genus. Yes. There, it is. there it is. Which includes the gerbil. Yeah, maybe gerbils would be susceptible. Or hamsters. Yeah, I, I believe hamsters are not. Um, okay. So the other model that, that, I mean, we obviously would love mice to work. Um, so what a, a group in Iowa headed by Stan Perlman did was they made a, they took an adenovirus and express the human receptor for MERS called DPP4 or mm -hmm. CD26. Mm -hmm. And they took that um, adenovirus and, and gave it to mouse, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to mice intranasally so that there, um, it infected the lung cells. And then uh, four days after, after the adenovirus transduction, they then infected with MERS and they got replication. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I so, also meant to ask you whether Australia has reported any MERS. So no they've got tons Australia. of tons of camels. They're just I know that was one of the them. places we looked at first. Okay. Um, okay. And I called. All, I I tried to get contacts there. We couldn't get samples because it's hard to get camel samples into the U.S. at all. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, unless they're but, cigarettes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, those will let in anywhere. Um, but yeah, I've not heard of any any cases any positive positive either sera or yeah. or rna positive animals in, i uh, recall there was a time when the camels in saudi arabia were developing tuberculosis and they actually had to slaughter a bunch of camels but then they imported replacements from australia and they were healthy and uh, viable of course that's how they got to australia to begin with <laughs> they were brought there during the 1800s because those are the only animals that could, could traverse the uh, central desert and uh, and then you know what they did afterwards? They killed most of the camels when they finished their expedition, but really? a, a few got away. Yeah, and I heard that story, and they wanted to kill them all because they didn't want to introduce another animal to the Australian outback, and they did by accident. Of course, camels can run faster than people, <laughs> and they can run longer than people can run too in deserts. So, so that's how they actually got there. And uh, you know that first traverse of uh, Australia was done by a camel. And, Australia uh, is not very good at containing their animals. Not, not at all. In fact, <laughs> there's a lot of us there too that shouldn't be probably. <laughs> no, um, sorry. Go ahead. In the in the camels, this infection is uh, generally harmless, self-limiting, not chronic, right? Um. Yes. So in the so the camels, the camels yes. develop 
antibodies against the virus, right. and those antibodies are, we're presuming, protective against subsequent infection? We don't know. But yes, I would assume, I would, I would predict they are, but um, whether mm. they get continuously infected and then kind of re, um, reboosted, we're not sure. Because what I'm angling at is um, it would be one way to, to contain this would be to vaccinate the camels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. what I was going to ask. And yes. so if antibodies are protective sure. um, for the camels, maybe, f I, I'm, I'm assuming somebody's focusing effort on that and, and looking into it, right? But you said they don't get sick anyway, so. Well, but that would be. Transmission if, to people. If they're then transmitting right. to people and then it's a vaccinate risk. Vaccinate every camel then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what and so Saudi Arabia in, certainly has the resources to yeah, do that. Yeah, sure. Yes. Of course they do. So in, uh, in Ian Lipkin's, uh, one of Ian Lipkin's papers, what they showed was that in camels that were essentially less than two years of age, they were RNA po and virus positive for the majority of them. And over two years of age, they were RNA and virus negative, but seropositive. Right. 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 And so the idea, at least the, the idea, is that the younger camels are what are transmitting the virus to people, um, and probably between themselves, and the um, and and potentially, if you could vaccinate uh, all newborn calves, then gotcha. you could gotcha. eliminate this as a reservoir species, or at least get uh, herd immunity, if you uh, take the pun, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to enough that you can slow down that that initial reservoir to human spread. And I think that um, I think it's a really good idea. I, uh, there are I know there are groups working on it, um, and uh, and accruing teams throughout multiple countries in the Middle East um, to do those kind of work. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because vaccination, uh, vaccinating the animals is a, a standard part of livestock husbandry most of the time. Sure. Right, exactly. So those things are, those definitely are ongoing now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and the, if you, the, one of the links we should put in there is this, uh, there, there's a, is a kissing camel uh, meme, if you want to call it that, on YouTube. So yes. there, there's a, there's a. Um, <laughs> That's right. There is a, how do I say this, um, a disbelief in uh, many people in the Middle East that camels are really causing MERS. And hmm. to, to show, be, and the reason is that they say, well, none of the camel, the, the, none of the camel handlers are getting sick. And de they deal with them every day. So how could it possibly be a camel virus? And so... Uh, I think the obvious reason is because they've been slowly, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the virus has been jumping back and forth for a while, just like it did for SARS, and they probably have um, uh, have antibodies against it, and they um, mm -hmm. are protected. So to to go against this, they are putting up videos on YouTube of themselves kissing their camels, yeah. oh, and boy. so to show that they are they are healthy. Um, but you know, Matt, in this there was one study in Egypt in some, in abattoirs where. Um, I think none of the workers were seropositive. Right, exactly. So no, I, I agree. And those I would be I, older camels, though, wouldn't they? Uh, yeah, it could be that the slaughtered ones are older, yeah, so they don't have virus. Yeah, that could be. I, I'm going to digress here, but there was just a story that I heard on, wait, wait, don't tell me, that there's an increase in salmonella cases in the U.S. because people keeping chickens in their backyard are kissing their chickens. Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's only a matter of time. Enough people take pictures kissing their camels. Do, do. You know? And their baby turtles. Don't forget the baby turtles. Right, right. Wow. Yeah, so the, wow. all of that together, it's, it's not helping. <laughs> it's not helping at all. Uh, no, it's not. So Maybe yeah, just I mean, shaking I'm, hands would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, so, Alan, on. you mentioned before that if you can prescribe an, a, an FDA approved drug for anything. So, could tomorrow a physician prescribe one of these drugs? Sure. For a sick patient? Yeah. Yeah, they can. In fact, this, is, um, this has been an off and on scandal in the drug industry because, of course, drug companies, uh, they'll get the drug approved for something. And then it often turns out in the course of clinical practice that people figure out that it's good for something else too. Right. right. And yeah. then drug companies wanting to sell more drugs mm -hmm. um, will sort of covertly market the drugs for that purpose. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we're just going to drop off these papers about how <laughs> it can be used for this other indication. And there have been a lot of um, uh, legal actions stemming out of that because that's illegal, mm -hmm. promoting right. the drug for that use. But th if the doctor decides to give a drug for a particular use, then mm -hmm. it's between them and their malpractice insurer. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, so the the case here would be um, if you and, and people are doing a lot of this screening FDA approved compounds because it obviously short circuits a lot of the approval process. You already know these things are safe. Um, so they're being screened for all sorts of indications, and you can buy these libraries. Um, but um, uh, the reason to do an additional trial, as Matt kind of already outlined, would be you, if you were going to promote it as a public health thing in, in the event of an outbreak, you would like to know that it actually does work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're, I mean, we can't say which one of these is really going to work in people, so that's not possible right. yet. But um, what, was, what happened when the um, <clears throat> one of the first... Um, animal model papers from uh, Heinz Feldman's lab at, at uh, Rocky Mountain Labs in uh, Montana, uh, they showed that ribavirin and interferon work synergistically in cells and also in uh, to protect m macaques in their hands. And when the Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia was asked about that combination, he said, oh, we already tried that because that's what people did for SARS. And we tried it in um, very sick people as, a, as an initial test and it didn't do anything. So we don't want to get anyone's hopes up at all. Um, uh, we think we have very good candidates in this pool that we're working on now in the lab, um, and uh, hopefully we can get all the all of the information out as fast as we can uh, for things that look protective. Yeah, yeah, and you wouldn't want the um, you know the the big pandemic to be the first time you do the experiment. No, no, but you know the 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 question is how do you do how do you do these trials? How do you do yeah. these trials? Right, you can't do you have to do this trial. Like they like they already did, where for ribavirin and, and interferon, mm -hmm. which is in very sick people, right? Um, and that's the where you have to start, and then you go from there. Um, I think the good thing is that if you can find one of the drugs that works in the lab, also has that also has a very uh, safe, um, a very good safety profile, they should be used as um, as prophylactically for healthcare workers that are dealing with patients in the front line, and I think that is where um, we may be able to help a lot of people. Yeah. All right. Great. Any, do we miss anything, Matt? Um, nope. I think that's it. Great. Good summary. Thank no, you. No, but nobody's keeping bats as an experimental animal. Yeah, some people do. Yeah, I mean, there there are some groups doing bat studies now. Um, I've heard uh, some species work, some species don't. Exactly. Um, I don't know the data on on how they did the experiments to know whether one's real or not, but. Um, I mean, bats are hard to rear in the lab. Sure, uh, yeah. sure, camels sure. are even harder, potentially. That's right. Um, you know, all of these things have to be done in specialized labs. It's a BLCL3 virus. And so it, it doesn't, all of this is hard. All of this is very hard. It, mm -hmm. it, it's even harder because you, it's hard to get camel samples into the U.S. because of um, foot and mouth disease. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, not being allowed, those samples aren't allowed in. You have to go through Plum Island or one of the other USDA sites. And um, that makes it, uh, you know, one extra step of difficulty to get approval. So... Um, all of these things are hard, and, and there's there's really no there's no easy way to do this. We do as much as we can in the lab, and then okay. we're trying to accrue partners in the Middle East that will help us at the next step. I'm going to visit a bat lab in Australia, Dixon. Great. I'll let you know if they for the Hendra virus. No, I. You're didn't. gonna go hang out. I'm gonna go hang out. You bet. You bet. <laughs> all right, we have uh, one more topic, and I think you will be interested in this, Matt, as well. It's actually. Good that you're here to, to to voice your opinion. This was originally sent by Joe, paper in Plus Medicine. He wrote, "Maybe I'm just totally downplaying the risks involved, but I can't understand why people don't want these gain of function influenza experiments to be done. After all, nature does them all the time. Mm -hmm. Though this is mostly forgotten by the time these opinion articles reach the six o'clock news. Thoughts? I should probably add that I don't think that these experiments are without risk." Any work with pathogenic viruses are always with risk, and I don't, also don't think that the proposed alternatives shouldn't be done or are not worth pursuing. I think all of these experiments should be done, though, as the authors surprisingly say, at least to me in the opinion, ultimately studies with intact viruses will be necessary for a full understanding of human transmissibility, a phenotype of a whole virus. From Joe is a postdoc a company in Pennsylvania. So the paper is an opinion or a policy forum piece published in PLOS Medicine. The title is Ethical Alternatives to Experiments with Novel Potential Pandemic Pathogens. And the authors are Mark Lipsich and Allison Galvani. And just the title already <laughs> is, um, is inflammatory. Ethical, implying that the current experiments are not ethical. 
and this is, the, in my view, this is the tone of the entire paper, which is full of mm-hmm. inflammatory and often uh, incorrect statements. So I thought we should go through this, and I, I have many things that I, I, that really bother me about this. Uh, Mark Lipsitch has been on record previously uh, speaking out against the influenza H5N1 ferret transmission experiments uh, over a year ago, saying that they shouldn't have been done and that they don't, they're do not they not of any value and so forth. But now he has put uh, maybe more specific recommendations on paper. And so um, let's go through this. So he starts out by saying, he, he again brings up the H5N1 experiments that Fouché and Kawaoka did some time ago, which we covered extensively here and where the phrase ferrets are not people came from. Exactly. Um, they, um, of course, adapted influenza H5H1 to be transmitted by aerosol among ferrets. And the key there, of course, is that the viruses lost their virulence when transmitted by the aerosol route. Now, this paper begins saying uh, that the work of Kawaoka and Fouché uh, was research that aims to produce, sequence, and characterize potential pandemic pathogens, PPPs, he calls them, novel infectious agents with known or likely efficient transmission among humans with significant virulence. I mean, this first sentence is is 100% <laughs> wrong. This was not the aim of these experiments. It was not to make a potential pathogen, and they certainly don't have known or likely efficient transmission among humans. They have absolutely no, we have no knowledge of their transmission among humans whatsoever. Which was kind of the point. Indeed. Yes. I mean, we still do not understand why any virus transmits and others do not, and that's the point of these experiments, right? We should also be leery of an article that is on a policy issue that says, that includes the sentence, we advocate a dispassionate review of pertinent evidence. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which, of course, is exactly what the article is not going to provide. It's not dispassionate whatsoever. No, it? no, they have a very clear case that they're trying to state here. Right. Indeed. Now, um, a main part of this article is uh, the idea that working with dangerous viruses, and they include H5N1, H7N9, uh, is inherently not safe because BSL-3 laboratories, or BSL-3+, plus, which is what you need to used to work on these viruses, or they claim you get uh, laboratory-associated infections, okay? And they, they cite numbers, which, in my view, are kind of theoretical, hypothetical numbers. He says, uh, laboratory-associated infections in BSL-3 facilities are conservatively estimated to occur at a rate of two per thousand laboratory years in the U.S., which is a completely manufactured number. Absolutely. And in fact, somebody we've got the there's the one of the citations behind that number is also uh, in the links here, right? Yeah, I went to look at that, and and it's completely hypothetical. They just pulled this out of their hindquarters. That uh, let's just say there's a 03 percent chance um, based on completely qualitative analysis, and then they go and spin that number into a whole calculation of how frequently we can expect these accidents to occur, which is absurd because the statistical sample we have of the number of BSL-3 accidents is just way too small. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Can I also interject something yeah, here as a, uh, as a comp- dispassionate observer? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a sentence, we, I want to go back to this, because yeah. you asked me to read this paper in its entirety, and I did, although I wasn't uh, enamored with doing so, because we've already covered this topic several times, but... but the sentence in the first paragraph uh, at the end says the H1N1 uh, yes, influenza strain responsible for significant morbidity and mortality around the world from 1977 to 2009, now get this phrase, is thought to have originated, thought to have originated from a laboratory accident. Thought to have originated? There's no proof. It's just thought to have originated. That's right. Well, I could say it's thought to have originated from MERS in camels in Saudi Arabia, for instance. <laughs> because you thought it, yes. Yeah, because I thought it, and it, I thought uh, that's. I would have scratched the, the article just for that alone. Well, that's, when you're an editor of the, when you're on the editorial board of the journal, you can avoid that. You no, know, the reference number four. Uh, I'll just go to it right now. Is uh, a Webster Bean Gorman Chambers Kawasaki? No, Kawa. 
Kawaoka. Kawaoka. Evolution and Ecology of Influenza A Viruses. It's a review article. It's a review, right. Yeah. It's a review article. It's not even solid data presenting science. It's a review article of the literature. And you can say anything in a review article like, well, I think it might be this or I think it might be that. That's in the discussion. That's up for grabs, kids. This is <laughs> Yeah, that's often done in this in this opinion. No, no, it's an opinion. Okay, it's an opinion. It's a bad opinion. That's my view. <laughs> yeah, there's so <laughs> that that it. is a belief that this might have come from a lab, but no one has any evidence. Science is not it a belief. It might have come from a clinical trial, not a lab, you know, where you're actually putting virus into people. So, I think that's not a valid uh, use. Not it's not a valid example to say that laboratories are inherently dangerous. Right? You should base your opinions on facts. <laughs> And if this is an opinion journal article, then where are the facts? Right. <laughs> they then go on to um, talk about ethics of uh, doing experiments. And um, they, they use the Nuremberg trial data for the this. Nuremberg Code. Yeah, the okay. Nuremberg Code. A seminal document in clinical research ethics specifies that in research conducted on human participants, the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem. Okay, fine, but we're not researching uh, human participants in this. <laughs> no. In these, we're researching on ferrets, so I, I actually don't see what the relevance of that is. Right. Right. Ferrets are not humans. They are not humans really? for sure. We're doing bingo here. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, another thing they cite from the code: uh, the the uh, experiment should be such to yield results for the good of society, unprocurable by other methods or means of study, and not random and us- unnecessary in nature. So they're saying that these uh, studies are random and unnecessary. This is a very typical strategy in collegiate debate, where it's a fine thing to do to teach yeah, yeah, people yeah, yeah. the structure of bad arguments. Ah, here, here. Um, <laughs> that's exactly right. So what you do is you collect all the evidence that's favorable to your position. You cherry uh-huh. pick, of course, and then you string it together in in a chain in a way that leads to your preferred conclusion. Bingo. So what we've got here is we're taking maximally, uh, maybe not even maximally po- pessimistic, um, fantastically pessimistic projections. <laughs> um, gee, what if the risk of a BSL-3 disaster was 20%? Um, then, uh, you know, we're looking at a virtual certainty of the release of, of one of these agents, and it's going to become a pandemic because, you know, we're going to cite some more review articles. Um, and then we go to the Nuremberg Code, which is about a completely different topic. Correct. Um, the Nuremberg mm-hmm. Code Bait is, this is, a, this is, was developed to prevent things like the Tuskegee syphilis study, which, mm-hmm. by the way, was in complete violation of the Nuremberg Code. Exactly it, right. was, it was about human experimentation. Dr. Which is Mangala, not even on the. It's not even in the discussion with a BSL three, you know, yeah. molecular research on viruses. But they're going to drag that in in order to create an ethical debate um, around this threat that they've now drummed up. Well, I hate to say this too because I, I, I totally agree, Alan. This is uh, A plus B equals Z. You can't yep. go that way. The the, the BCL four facility in Boston. BCL four. Yeah. It's running a risk of not opening ever. And I think arguments such as this have been leveled at that building as sure. an argument to say that this is this the entire city of Boston will get wiped out by a pandemic, yeah, uh, if we allow this to happen. That's just total nonsense. It's nonsense. Now, listen to this. Um, they have a box on gain of function. They say ferret transmission is thought to be a good albeit imperfect model for human to human transmission. I'm not aware of any such conclusion. Okay, it is not a model for transmission. If it were, we'd understand transmission. It's, then he says, anyway. Consequently, strains resulting from selection for heightened ferret transmission are likely to be similarly transmission transmissible by humans via respiratory droplets. What a leap! It's just unbelievable. It's the same tactic. Same tactic. Yes. Same yep. Conduct laboratory. I mean, th- these are all the same. These are all the same arguments about the Kawoka and Fouché work before. Right. right? So, yeah. yeah. Sure. None of it's new. I mean, I the, the one of the links they link to is this um, uh, article from the um, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which right. came out a couple of years ago. I remember seeing this when it came out about that we shouldn't do SARS work either, and yeah. that it's all all of the work in the BSL three is is, is <laughs> too dangerous to do. 
Um, and the the numbers, you know, they use the same kind of skewed numbers there, where it's the the numbers of um, hours worked in a BL three compared with right. the really really low number of of um, cases of any exposure at all, um, and they multiply that out to infinity basically. And I mean, none of this is useful to debate. I think it. I think that the. I mean, maybe it's useful to debate, but it's not really um, uh, going to be consequential, really. I, I really think they should redirect their attention towards nuclear weapons development. Uh, that's something I would be afraid of. <laughs> you know, you know, they, there's a laboratory somewhere that's got lots of radioactive material there, and you know, sure, that's that's the one that I would really want to keep my eyes on, and uh, that's that's a weapon that could actually wipe out a whole bunch of people in a, in a hurry. This stuff is come on. The ferret studies didn't result in any uh, outbreaks and in people, did it? No, because. Of course and not. It would not. I mean, and the reason not. is because, <laughs> come on, Kathy, you can say it now. <laughs> because <laughs> parrots are not, not people. Human. <laughs> <laughs> it's not soil and green, kids. <laughs> they they also do something here which bothers me. They take two of the justifications um, of doing the transmission experiments that were mentioned by the authors, and he he goes through a long long amount of of writing to say uh, these are not good justifications. You know. Why do we need to know the, the amino acid changes that lead to transmission? They're not going to help us in surveillance. They're not going to help us in making a better vaccine. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, that may be true, but there's even a greater reason to understand transmission. That is to understand yeah, what sure. controls it. Sure, and he sure. doesn't even mention this. Right. Why I mean, do we need to understand uh, how bacteria exchange genetic material? Yeah, right. <laughs> they, I mean, back date to wait before... A wait to yes, before wait a go back to, yeah. to the time before we knew that information, yeah, sure. and it seemed completely useless. Bacteria exchange information? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I mean, that's why he, he calls for a risk-benefit analysis, which is, is totally impossible with science, oh because God, you on. never know where things are going, right? And that example that Alan just brought up, you know, yeah. you study restriction of nucleic acids in bacteria, and it turns out to spawn a new industry. You wouldn't have predicted that, so you can't do a risk-benefit. What about the escape of smallpox several times? That was stopped in its tracks because you can recognize the disease and quarantine the people and treat them. And and it's crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Then they also propose these more ethical experiments, as they call them, which, as far as I can tell, most of them (sighs) are useless for understanding transmission, molecular modeling of proteins. In, they're they're useful things. Some of they're, them are useful. Some of them, uh, in fact, yeah, yeah, most of them, I'd say, are are experiments that yeah. are worth doing I and don't that think should be. That, uh, expressing individual proteins is going to tell you much about transmission, but I agree. Um, but it's well, useful you know, to know the yeah. biochemistry for the same reason it's useful to know um, what genetic changes are uh, foster. Okay, you know, I think I think using other strains is fine. You know, sure. uh, the more you do, the more you're going to learn. But then again, as Joe pointed out. They do say in the end, we're going to have to. Right, you have to use, use whole viruses. viruses. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. They're all they're all useful experiments in the concept of understanding how an actual virus infection works in the first right. place. Right. Yeah. So, and I just have a quibble with one fact on the very last page. Um, I, I don't I don't know that there's any basis for this. Elucidating the evolutionary trajectory through which existing seasonal parentheses former pandemic viruses became transmissible. So is there evidence that existing seasonal are former pandemic viruses? Yeah, that, uh, what, yeah they so evolve what, to be, you know, they become seasonal because most of the population or a good fraction becomes immune, so it doesn't spread in a pandemic manner. But they're not the same as the no, former they, pandemic viruses. They've they evolved. Change. Yeah, they so, have evolved. So sure. yeah. it just... You know, that, it's kind of misleading and that sounds like it's the same virus, right? Yeah, I didn't like that. I mean, he, so the, the problem then is that in the end, they say, we believe the benefits of alternative approaches will be greater than those of novel experimentation, which is a completely wrong statement to make because you don't know, as we've said so many times, you just can't predict what experiments are going to result in. If you have competent scientists doing well-planned experiments, then you're going to get good information in the end. To yeah, say and this, this is, is going to be better than that is completely wrong. And this is research that I think we would all agree needs to be subjected to um, to strict scrutiny and strict regulation. This is not something you should let people do in in an uncontained laboratory. 
uh, which is why we have these containment levels with BSL three, BSL four, you know, BSL three plus, um, and very finely, finely shaded um, regulations about exactly what you can and cannot do in these different sorts of facilities. So this is something that needs to be done carefully, but it, it's it's a big step to go from there to say that it shouldn't be done at all. Well, what they would like is what they say is that we urge proposals for any future experiments on PPPs be evaluated according to quantitative risk benefit analysis guided by the principles of the Nuremberg Code. It's just except that you, it's unquantifiable and the Nuremberg Code doesn't apply. That's yes. right. That's right. Yeah. Other than that, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have we have <laughs> rules in place for if you want to do these experiments sure. and you want to support it with an NIH grant, you have to fulfill these. These yeah. criteria, those were set in place. I think they are absolutely acceptable, and uh, this doesn't make any uh, this this doesn't make any sense at all. But I'm disturbed that it's published in PLOS Medicine. It has a forum. It's it's gotten through the news, and it's going to scare some people. And I, I think it's it's uh, all of its points are really unfounded. So I thought we needed yeah. to mm-hmm. say this because we do have a lot of listeners who might not read about this or, or read this paper directly, but might hear about it. So. I want them to know that this is, what should we say? This is not a good opinion. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how'd you like the play? Exactly <laughs> yeah, right. right. Exactly right. Right, exactly. Yes, okay. That's right. The acting was uneven. <laughs> the acting was uneven. <laughs> hey, Matt, you still there? I'm right here. Did you get your R1 done? Uh, still in process. Do you want to leave now and go work on it? Uh, good. No, I'm good for a little longer. You're good no for a little leave now? All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do some email. Uh, <clears throat> oh, cool. Look at this. Look at our first one. Kathy, you want to take that first one? Sure. Esteemed Twiv Hopes, follow up, Robin style. This is from Rich Condit. Why a single stranded genome? Single stranded DNA takes up less room than double stranded DNA. Therefore, packaging a single stranded DNA genome rather than a double stranded DNA genome permits propagating more genetic information in a limited size capsid. The pat- packaging size is a fact. The extrapolation from that fact is my fantasy. <laughs> I wonder if the higher mutation rate in single strand DNA viruses doesn't have to do with the absence of a spare copy of the correct information encoded on the complementary strand. If a double stranded DNA containing virion sustains environmental damage, there's a chance that only one strand will be damaged and the correct information can be recovered via the complementary strand. If a single strand DNA containing virion sustains the same damage, there is no backup. Uh-huh. He channeled my thoughts exactly. I was thinking the same thing as I listened to that twist. So this is one where I asked, asked uh, XJ Mang why single-stranded DNA, right? Mm-hmm. A couple of twists ago, yeah. Mm-hmm. So does this make sense, the um, the two strands? if one, I guess so. If one is mutated, then the other one can, can sure. reproduce, yeah. Right. Right. So okay. is there any – but the question I had about this, is there any data on the um, – Quasi species that's formed from a single strand versus a double stranded DNA virus, and like, can you actually quantify the maybe not fidelity? I guess fidelity works and it works its way in, but the actual um, like if you sequence a bunch of virions from each of those uh, a prep of single a single stranded or a double stranded DNA virus, do you get more mutations in the single stranded versus double stranded? So are are single stranded viruses more mutagenic? Yes, they are. There's data from in plant viruses. Uh, there's a plant virologist at Rutgers, Siobhan, can't remember her last name. She's going to be at ASV this year anyway. She has data showing that uh, there's That's a good. higher mutation rate in single-stranded DNA viruses. Yep. So there there are data, yeah. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dixon, I think you should take the next yeah, one. Yeah, I would agree with that. Don't actually. you think? I do. I do, actually. I'll try to do my best with it. So this was uh, sent to us from Antimoeba Histolytica. Hmm. <laughs> a nom de plume, if I ever heard one. You get one. it, Dixon? You get I got it. it. I got it. Writes, Nature <laughs> ran a contest for the science fiction story is written in 200 characters or less. I thought you guys would get a kick out of the biology-related ones. Runners up. Cynthia was learning faster than anyone had predicted. The apparently totipotent cells continued to proliferate at an exponential rate. Today would be the last time they would refer to her as a mouse. (laughs) 
As robots perform the laboratory work, it is cheaper just to electronically stimulate the areas of the student's brain associated with frustration and failure, and then, after three years, call them doctor. (laughs) The professor smiled. I've just isolated the plague vector. Now we can kill it. I sighed with relief. I'll tell the others. He held my arm as I turned away. Hang on, old chap. Amy, pass me the syringe. Despite her growing love for him, the mission demanded it happened now. He sat on the bed and placed his hand on her leg. Hmm. She turned inside out, enveloping the president. Endocytosis won the ten-day war. (laughs) It was a novel trial, the first of its kind. The charge was illegal human cloning, creating a sentient sentient human. Sentient. Okay, let's try this again. (laughs) Take two. It was a novel trial, the first of its kind. The charge was illegal human cloning, creating a sentient human in laboratory. The verdict was guilty. Ironically, the sentence was life. (laughs) Wait a minute. Years of cheap computer time allowed the TK Labs gene coin project to decode all the junk DNA in the human genome. Now, a lone tech sees the output flashing on the screen. Intentionally left blank. (laughs) (laughs) I lost my arms at work. New arms made from tissue scaffolding, or scaffolds, takes too long to grow. No work, no money. So my boss fused a used pair of robotic arms onto me. My robot overlords finally promoted me. Well, those those were clever. Yeah, I bet you we could have a contest and see if we could add to that. It didn't tell us what the winners were, though. Yeah, they said all uh, runners up. Huh? I guess if you go to this website, maybe they were winners. all runners up. <laughs> there were no. You're saying there were no winners. There were no winners. <laughs> all the stories were above average. <laughs> What's that's that right. from? What is that from? Lake Wobegon. Lake, Lake Wobegon. Oh, that's Wobegon. right. That's right. I've never listened to this. <laughs> that's right. All the men are good. Oh, yeah, they are. There are plenty of them. <laughs> oh, there are lots more at the website. I'm sure. Yes. I am sure. But these were just the science ones, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. They're all, it's nature. They should all be science, right? Uh, maybe. All right. Um, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Dear esteemed, uh, this is uh, YL, um, writes, Dear esteemed professors, I have developed an intimate relationship with your podcasts, TWIV MP. I'm, cer- I'm certain great benefits are reaped from your podcast, specifically in poor resource settings, and I've recommended it to a couple of friends in Sudan who now have started listening. Huh. Your podcast is certainly a valuable and free educational resource for a country with a lot of the infectious agents that you have discussed in your various episodes. Despite having a high burden of infectious diseases, we unfortunately remain lagging in our knowledge about them, whether human or zoonotic. Heck, we even have our own virus, Sudan virus. <laughs> Right. That's a link to that. Yeah. Not only that, but the Welcome Tropical Labs were also based in our country. Uh, Civil War, unfortunately, left us where Henry Welcome has found us nearly a century ago. Mm. On a different note, I'm amazed at the encyclopedic knowledge of both Professor de Pommier and <laughs> Professor, Professor Schachter. Is there anything they don't know, and how are they able to retain so much knowledge? Serious question. Again, many thanks for your kindness, and I'm certain you all have a good night's sleep as you're um, as your conscience has to be clear for sharing this beauty with us. Dixon, how do you retain so much knowledge? Everything you've heard on this program, I've read. <laughs> I, I, I have no memory whatsoever. I have to bring sheets with me and read them. <laughs> All right. I hate to say this, Vincent, but I'm smelling something reminiscent of smoke. Yeah, it's just the intake uh, taking some, some factory smoke. I hope right, that's right. It's okay. It's, I, I think you're thinking there. <laughs> yeah, really. I'm, I'm overthinking the problem that's right <laughs> Matt can you take Robbins sure uh, so the question is uh, to what extent have these herbs helped or hindered the repair and regeneration of body parts so it's on uh, human endogenous retroviruses and stem cells so the question is uh, salmonella's, uh, salamanders regenerate amputated limbs geckos shed their tails when grabbed by tail and flea later regenerating them I've done it myself for example, grabbed household gecko tails. Oh. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> no, wait a minute. Stop right there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, Matt. Matt, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we'll leave it alone there. Okay. Uh, and noted later uh, that le- the regrowth of the appendage. That should be at least as complex as the regeneration of a limb with the regeneration of uh, sclerotome, myotome, and dermato- uh, dermatome. Every newborn human will regenerate 
a distal phalanx, including the nail, if lost, within the first week of life. Could the progressive loss of regenerative capacity from amphibian through reptile to mammal be related to genomic alterations induced by yet unrecognized or now unrecognizable viruses? Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is all, so, this has to do with herbs uh, controlling pluripotency. Do you know that story, Matt? I do, a little bit. It's but I actually, cool. I have a friend, uh, Jason Peltieri, who I went to grad school with, mm. who works on planaria. And uh, how mm-hmm. they can, you can cut them into pieces and they regenerate whole sure. planaria yeah. out of them, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I asked him, actually. This is one of the questions uh, that I asked. <laughs> and so he said that, um, uh, he, uh, let's, I'll just para- paraphrase what he said. He said, he doesn't particularly agree with the premise of the progressive loss from, of regenerative capacity from amphibians to reptiles to mammals. Hmm. He said the human liver, for example, has a exactly. phenomenal regenerative capacity. That's true. Um, and as the listener of notes, a number of cases of human uh, digital regeneration have been documented in humans and not just actually in, in uh, the first week of life in adults too. Um, so re- evolutionary changes in regenerative capacity are more species and tissue specific than is implied by right. the question. But um, don't try that at home, kids. No, correct. No, don't chop your finger off to see if it works again. Um, Given the degree of complexity, I would personally doubt there's some general mechanism for evolutionary loss of regeneration, whether it be virus-induced genomic alterations or something much more interesting and important. Hmm. Um, he said, could viruses play a role in this? Sure. Um, he <laughs> says, tell them to start a lab and find out. Um, <laughs> right. So I think the answer is maybe. Um, and uh, I think that there's a... Uh, whether the, the, that's really a, plays a role in evolution, you know, millions of years ago, I, I you know, I guess the the, the, the jury is out on that question. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Interesting idea, though. Yeah, it is. You're going to go on with the rest of it, Matt? Uh, sure. So this is on herpes virus and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So since herpes virus samiri is found in squirrel monkeys, and squirrel monkeys are native to the tropical forests of Central and South America. The next step would be to get a travel history from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patients, in particular travel to a residence in Central and South America for patients in their close contacts. Mm. Exposure to squirrel monkeys outside their native geographic distribution might also be significant, such as in zoos, labs, and pet shops. Um, right. Yep. <clears throat> so, as another interesting idea, I, I, I would doubt that everyone with uh, IPF has some history of travel t- and squirrel monkey uh, yeah. Interaction in uh, <laughs> Central South America, but right. yeah, potentially that's a link. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's some literature. There's a review article about gamma herpes viruses and pulmonary fibrosis, and then an interview with the chief executive officer of Enzo about herpes simiri and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So, mm-hmm. yeah, someone had asked our opinion on it a while ago. Yeah, yeah. So. But and just our opinion, in, not in, the uh, facts. Skip Virgin's lab from Washington, they published a paper a while ago showing that actually herpes virus infection in the mice um, uh, upregulates the immune response and actually protects you from other pathogens. Yeah, so that's right. In their case, it was a protective effect as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, as we know, the balance of the immune response is critical to all these things. Yep. Mm-hmm. One more. Oh, sorry. Um, e- EBV and freshman. On EBV yeah. and freshman. So oh. Robin is the stream of consciousness uh, yeah, letter writer. It's just one little <laughs> nugget after another. Right. There, there's from actually pod- two more nuggets here. <laughs> yeah, this is so. good. Uh, from your podcast, it would seem that it has a predilection of for freshmen to get fresh, an association that would be that has been well known for a long time. That's right. <laughs> Indeed. And then someone made the statement: gut microbiome educates the immune response that is not only local, but also distal to the gut. And Robin says, Matt, you can take it. Sure. Uh, the word distal has a connotation of further downstream or further away from the center. Indeed. It implies directionality, unlike the word distant, which uh, just refers to a spatial dimension. The former is in, sense, is in a sense vector, while the latter is scalar. Distal to the gut, in the old days, would be to the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. we had a woman here who used to teach with us, uh, Suzanne Holmes Giannini, who used to give the students this following conundrum. Why is the descending colon the ascending colon? Mm. Very nice. nice. And they, they, they actually didn't get it, <laughs> which was too so, bad. So I had, I had made that statement about the gut microbiome. So instead of distal, uh, what should I use? Distant? 
I suppose that's what Robin is trying to say. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next one is from Jacob, who writes, Hi, all. In response to Robin's email about helicopters, TWIV 272, Vincent said that it's a pity that so much money is wasted on these that could be spent on science. As a response, I'd like to show you this link showing how sky cranes are very useful for <laughs> us Australians in bushfire season. True, true, true. Okay. So it's it's a video of firefighting helicopters in Australia. Right. I, I understand that they have good uses, but of course, if they didn't have a military origin, they wouldn't be there for the bushfires, right? Right. Yeah. Weather is 17 degrees Celsius and alternating between overcast, drizzle, and rain here in Sydney. Pretty much the same as every day for the last three weeks, so we're unlikely to need them right now. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm here, I thought I'd wade into the discussion about the terms we avoid in science. I always have a problem with saying something is designed to carry out a function rather than has evolved to, as designed implies there is a, de a designer, just my <laughs> Australian two cents. I, I agree, but evolved to is also bad in the Flint era of yeah, 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 writing, yeah. okay? Because viruses evolved to do this. She hates that, and I think mm. that that's correct. Yeah. There are other ways to put is, it. Is it okay to say they have evolved and do mm. such and so? Mm. Is it the two that bothers her? I yeah, think selected two. for yeah. is a much better. The direction. Way. Yeah, selected for, yeah. Th like this has people. been selected for by evolution or something like that. That's but the right. two is the problem. It implies, you know. Right. Right. They, ha they have evolved the ability to. Exactly. Is that okay? Uh, no, no, that's no good. No, okay. They can't evolve <laughs> to do anything, no. They have okay. evolved and they now do this. Right. Yeah. Well, there, these are the that's survivors. These it, yeah. are the survivors. So he also gives us a link of banned words for science journalists by <laughs> Carl Zimmer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is funny. I hadn't seen this before. Yeah. Um, so there you go. That's not our words. Access as a verb, yeah. Mm. And slash or. <laughs> Logic gates do not belong in prose. <laughs> and if he has expressing proteins here. He doesn't like in vitro or in vivo, huh? Mm. That's. I don't bad. think the general, I think this is more to the general yeah. population for science writing. Yes. Right. No one knows what in vivo means. I use aliquot in my normal speech, and my family has no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at this. He doesn't like virulence. He doesn't like transmissibility. Well, not that he doesn't like it, but he thinks... Uh, well, this, this, is, this is for science writers for a general audience. Right. And then he doesn't like use of the word we... As hmm. in, we now know the fatality ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, some of us know and some of us don't. it would be the don't. case fatality ratio. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That's very nice. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, let's do one more. Um, who started? I did. Kathy, please yeah. do one more. Melissa writes, the debates about vaccinations continue. Mm. My friends who are health professionals post frequently articles such as this one. I wonder what the scientists at TWIV have to say about it. And do they know scientists or family members who don't vaccinate? My dad got polio the year before they came out with the vaccine. In addition to almost dying back then, struggling through life as disabled, he is now suffering from post-polio and will probably die because of it. I don't want my, parentheses, future child to s suffer the same fate. And Melissa gives a link to a blog post. Uh, by It's called She Unearthed Blog. Um, and so... Uh, it's yeah. It, I see Alan's pick from last yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. My <laughs> was my first thought. Well, his pick from this week too, when we linked to it. Yes, <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, just another uh, mm -hmm. vaccine thing. But she asks, do we know scientists or family members who don't vaccinate? Um, I know an immunologist who refuses to get the flu vaccine. Really? So we all know people like that, and yeah. But for what reason? Uh, I never heard the reasons, hmm. I, so I don't hmm. know. Well, I think flu vaccine is one thing, but not getting, not giving your kids the required childhood immunizations. That's yeah, that's, right. that's right. another thing because right. yeah. that's bad. There's right. no reason to do that. I mean, getting the flu vaccine is a crapshoot as to whether next year's virus will look similarly to the vaccine you just refused. And so that's a logical reason for not getting the vaccine. You're not against vaccination. You just don't think this one will work. Right. And I've heard people say that in science, you know, and, and part of them are right. I mean, it's only, what, 
what did we say, 40 to 50% effective? So yeah. when, you, when you're confronted with statistics like that, it's easy to sort of sidestep. But this year, Vincent and I actually went on record. <laughs> I mean, literally, we were photographed getting injected with this year's vaccine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which I'm very yeah. proud to say. I, 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 I'm glad I did that. This is really a horrible article, but yes. it's like, it's like <laughs> well, all the other... It's, a, it's just the same old nonsense uh, uh, that always gets trotted out for these. Ooh, vaccines contain chemicals and <laughs> antigens, and ooh, it's yeah. just the same nonsense. I don't, I don't remember if you guys talked about it. I don't know if it was the CDC that did the study, but there was a group that did a study where they, they took a, they did polls of people and whether they wanted, they were, they vaccinated their, their family or themselves or not. And then they took some of them and then they educated them about the truth about vaccines and, and protection studies and everything. And they found that the more, the people that they told all the extra yes. data to, had less uh, lower percentage of people who actually after that wanted to vaccinate their kids. Right. Yeah, we did mention that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We so did. weird phenomenon. But the, but the problem, one I thing think one thing that definitely works, and this is maybe in the same study or or um, certainly in some earlier ones, um, is oddly enough anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, is saying that you vaccinate your own kids. Mm -hmm. For for a pediatrician to say, well, you know, I make sure that my kids get all their shots apparently has a much bigger influence um, on reluctant parents than than saying that uh, uh, all the academic literature are telling you that this is correct. Yeah. And then I heard the NPR show where they had a pediatrician being interviewed. I think it was Fresh Air with Terry. Uh, Terry... Right. Yes, and uh, he said the easiest way to get parents to comply is just say, well, if you won't allow me to vaccinate your children, you'll probably have to find another pediatrician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you take it that serious? And he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's what he said. He says, and then they just cave. So that I would rather have you as a pediatrician than to fight this vaccination thing. Go ahead, do it. And which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, all of the arguments, uh, it, it, as a scientist, it's hard to, when you're honest with people about the numbers of how much, how, what percentage of vaccinations are, um, are actually give you a, a vaccine response, give you an immune response, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you give those type of numbers about success rates and everything else, they're never 100%. No. And so right. then the response is, well, then it doesn't work. So we're not, you know, how do you, if you only, if you only protect 40% of the population, then my kids can be the sixty percent that don't or don't get it in the first place. Show them a movie of a little baby suffering from whooping cough; they'll change well, their mind. Right? That's the uh, that's the rebuttal. Is yeah. we don't have the diseases around now in that's enough right. number that's where right. people that's see right. kids dying of measles and, and whooping cough and um, sure. uh, you know all these other vaccine preventable diseases that they had you know <laughs> and when our parents were there. Sure. Yeah, and statistics are notoriously poor uh, at at persuading people. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just look at the multi-billion-dollar success of the lottery. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Right? We, this is this is this is proof positive that the general public does not get statistics. No. Nope. One of the things they do in this blog post, you pointed this out, Matt, is they have package inserts and they highlight one that says this vaccine has not been tested for efficacy in people. Well, you know what? When you make a seasonal vaccine every year, you don't have to do, you don't have no. to show <laughs> protection by the vaccine. You just have to do some safety. Right. Uh, studies, so it's unfair of them to highlight that because that happens every year and it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. typical um, tactics, right? Yeah. Yep. All right, let's do some links, some picks, not links, picks of the week. Picks. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked one that's just uh, amazing pictures of snails, <laughs> uh, sort of nice. macro photography. These are cool. They're so nice. cool. Nice. I, I, I almost can't believe they're real. I know. They're, they're, they're not posed. But, well, um, they stay still for a while, though. I'm pretty sure they're staged. <laughs> you think? Yeah, I, I wondered. But, you know, even at that, then, or if they're Photoshopped, I, you know, whatever. Uh, I just think bad. they're cool pictures. They're really... They, they have a, um, a human uh, yeah. feel to them. Kathy, right? yeah. if, you, if you access the movie on Netflix called um, Macro Cos Microcosmos... Yeah, okay. you, you it's a French film. Yeah. I did okay. pick it once. There's a there's a scene where two snails mate. 
Uh huh. It is the most sensuous thing I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. They're hermaphrodites, of course, and they have to exchange right. genetic material. But to watch them actually coming together, they look like they're a single snail at one point. It's quite remarkable. Wow. So yeah. I, I would follow that up with a movie. Speaking of slow mating, I once in a zoo, what I passed by, I think the Miami Zoo, there were two tortoises, you know, mating. <laughs> yes. And then three hours later, when we came back, they were still in the same position. <laughs> Take a long time. Indeed. Yeah, those are beautiful. I love them. They just yeah, have they have such human, right. they're reaching and, mm-hmm. oh, they're so cool. Sure. And they're beautiful. Sure. Alan, what do you have? I have um, a site that's kind of handy. Uh, it's called Do Not Link. It is great. But it's okay to click on the link to the website. <laughs> um, this is, you know, there are these URL shorteners like Bitly and and sorts of things that you can you can shorten a URL and, and link through their site. Um mm-hmm. If you need to do that, this one is kind of a similar service, except what it does is it, um, by rerouting the link, it prevents search engines from indexing it and improving the search ranking of the site that you're linking to. Ah. Now, this is, this is something that bloggers are intimately familiar with. If you're mm. blogging about some stupid thing that somebody has posted on the Internet, there's right. an irony right. to that because right. by linking to it, That's you right. are increasing the search ranking of that <laughs> stupid thing that you're objecting to. Exactly. Um, this is the solution. I believe, I, I don't know for sure that this works. Um, so that's the little, <laughs> little footnote I would put on it. Um, but it, from what I can tell, and I've seen a number of people use it, and I intend to use it as well, um, it's a, it, it seems like a handy thing. I'm going to use it for that uh, anti-vax. Yes. Like, for sure. There you go. Yes. For, you for the show notes, yeah. You bet. You bet. Maybe even the PLOS Medicine article. <laughs> that's a, that, <laughs> that is a good idea. Much. That's that a great a idea. Because that's, Plus well, that's in the academic literature. <laughs> yeah, it's still bad, though. Uh, Matt, what do you have? So I have a uh, a link to a blog post um, on science and their science careers. It's called uh, for, "Forgive Me, Scientists, for I Have Sinned," uh, and it's by a guy named Adam Rubin. And it's um, uh, basically a list of reasons why. Um, so the line is basically: sometimes I don't feel like a real scientist. Besides the fact that I do science every day, I don't conform to the image, or at least the, my image, of what a scientist is and how we should think and behave. And here's what I mean. Mm-hmm. And so he makes a list of all of these things that, that generally scientists are thought to do or to think like, um, but he doesn't think that way. And I think if any of us would go down the list, we would agree with 90% of the things on there or have done 90% of the things that are there. So, um, the, uh, yeah. I have avoided like eye contact with eager grad students while walking past their poster sessions. <laughs> right. Nah. Yeah. I have skipped talks at scientific meetings for social purposes. Um, sometimes I see sunshine on the, lo- on the lawn outside my office window and realize that I'd rather be outside in the sun. Uh, I have read multiple Michael Crichton novels. Right. I own no wacky science ties. You know, all of the obvious things that scientists shouldn't do, but uh, generally do. So the idea was, uh, I think from the post, is that, you, you know, it's the tongue-in-cheek, I've been hiding all of these things about me forever, and now I'm going to reveal it. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you read it, I think, it, you know, you'll get a really good idea of, of all the different variations of what science really is and how we think and, and uh, what it's like to be scientists. <laughs> I've gone home at 5 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the I, opening I love line. The one, I sometimes avoid foods containing ingredients science has proved harmless just because the label for an alternative has a drawing of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Really so what good. would be the penance for this? You make them go home and read Darwin's Origin of Species three times or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's really cool. Do you have a pick, I Dixon? do have a pick. I do have a pick. And you didn't like it, but I'm going to take it anyway. It's called The Electric Roadway. And it's a YouTube <laughs> video of a couple that have invented a series of interlocking uh, hexagonal tiles made from recycled material. Mostly it's from glass and from uh, discarded rubber from, uh, from tire treads and stuff like this. They've fashioned these things into LED light-emitting diode patterns for highways you could build a highway out of this material and they they sit down and interlock together and you can make uh, parking lots out of them and but they're also solar panels okay so they actually absorb sunlight create electricity with them and uh create an impervious service surface rather uh which you can use very creatively to 
Uh, if you watch the YouTube video of this, uh, you'll be impressed with it. Uh, and they crowdsourced this thing, and they got something like a million and a half dollars in a week to go ahead and continue their prototypical uh, development. But they also have a grant from the uh, United States Department of Highways to uh, to see how practical this might be when they uh, stitch it all together into a product. So I think you'll so. Is this the solar roadways? That's the one. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's yes. The one. Raised one point six million on Indiegogo. I've got have it. Have you seen it? Wow. Have you seen it? Alan, you like it. I mean, you'll find it. I just you know, think it's never happening. It's not. Pr- you know what? They said that about the airplane. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> no, but you would have. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have. I don't no. say it about everything. I just think this is. Uh, I'm not going to put solar panels on every highway in the U.S. No, they're going to start with uh, parking lots and private uh, driveways and stuff like this first to show how practical it is. <sighs> and then I think once the uh, community the, gets, the, gets think, wind of it, they're going to. Uh, I think the capital investment is too high. No, it's, you, we, you know what? You yeah, this is never going to be cheaper than asphalt. Um, they never said that in there. Uh, and that's the key to getting a road paved in solar cells. Well, this road pays for itself after a while, though. Hmm? Is it going to pay for itself after a few truckloads of salt get driven down it in the wintertime here in Massachusetts? That's a great <laughs> suggestion. You don't have to use salt because they are heated, and therefore you don't have to <laughs> throw the salt on the uh, roadway to okay. begin with. Well, I'm, I found the link, so I'm going to put it in your in your links, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not I, can see your skept- I can see your skepticism yes. right away here. That's okay. You know, they don't all have to be perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Dixon. I'm yeah, glad yeah. you have a pick. Uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be liked by everyone. No, no, of course not. Of course not. And I, you know that I give you trouble always. You do, you do. That's all right. All right. My pick is a Cold Spring Harbor site called BioArchive. B-I-O-R-X-I-V <laughs> dot org. Do you know what this is, Dixon? Uh, it looks like a... Um, Archive for biology. Yeah. That's what it looks you like. You can put your papers here before you submit them to a journal oh, I see. and um, then they get a publication date technically people can come and contact huh. comment on them and um, some journals will accept the paper uh, mm. after it's been here not like Journal of Virology does not but uh, other journals will and it's a it's a way of getting it out there. A lot of people like to do this. So in it's physics, not peer-reviewed. In physics, you don't put it peer-reviewed here, no, but there can be comments. In physics, this is how they publish their papers. It's not been done before in biology, but uh, I found this out at the ASM meeting because one of the speakers, Jesse Bloom, uh, talked about it, and he has some of his papers here. You can search for a virus, and you come up with, I don't know, a couple dozen papers. Huh. <clears throat> some of them are his. And, um, and most of these people will submit them s- subsequently, but uh, again, you can get it up here. So it's a, it's a distribution service for unpublished preprints. I think it's neat. kind of a neat idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like seeking opinions as to what do you think of this paper? Do you think I ought to publish it? Well, actually, he <laughs> said he got suggestions for fixing it while it was in review and so forth. So. Well, that's good. Yeah, some, yeah, it's kind of it's one small step away from open lab notebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's. I mean, they do. They look at the papers to make sure they're not offensive or nonsensical and mm-hmm. so forth. So they have an advisory board of some. Yeah, Mike Wiggler is here on the advisory board, who is a, a well-known. Mm-hmm. Oh, so they don't accept everything. No, well, they they're not going to accept spam. They won't take spam. They won't take your papers, Matt, because <laughs> <laughs> right. you know MERS is just irrelevant. So as, as we've talked about today, I know, and I shouldn't be working on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, they won't take everything, but as, if it's you know anything that we would do, I, I presume would go here. So check it out; it's pretty cool. I like the idea. I don't know where it's headed, but it's an interesting idea. And we have a listener pick from Daniel, who writes a pick of the week for Kathy. Here's a pick for you, Kathy. I know, and this is following oh. the story arc <laughs> of that stretch of time when every pick I ended up buying. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes. and then and then someone sent in a picture of some, oh, was it a Lamborghini or something? So this one uh, is a Mercedes-Benz Biome concept car uh, from 2010. And the press release is kind of amazing. Uh, biofiber is grown from proprietary DNA in the Mercedes-Benz nursery, where it collects energy from the sun and stores it in a liquid chemical bond called Bionectar 4534. As part of this process, the vehicle is created from two seeds. The interior of the biome grows from the DNA in the Mercedes star on the front of the vehicle, while the exterior grows from the star on the rear. To accommodate specific customer requirements, the Mercedes star is genetically engineered in each case, and the vehicle 
grows, in quotation marks, when the genetic code is combined with the seed capsule. The wheels are grown from four separate seeds. And it goes on and on in the press release. How funny. Um, so it is pretty funny. And um, I'm not going to be buying this one because it's an ugly car. <laughs> it really is Aww. ugly. Yeah. Too bad, too bad. Yeah, I'll show you Dixon here. Yeah, it's like really it. ugly. And it, it, they, well, the prototype looks like it's made out of fiberglass, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Was I mean, it 3D printed? The, the oh, idea, grown. this is this is some some design folks getting together and saying, yeah, let's yeah, make yeah. an organic shape, and yeah, then some marketing it, folks it. saying, let's come up with a, a narrative about the organic shape, it's funny, it's funny. and then that's what... I have someone I want to send that to. That's a good one. Uh, I don't know what's worse, this or the um, the other paper we did today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Daniel, I don't mean to make fun of your paper. Well, at, course, at least oh, I, at I least this it, is advertising that it's compost. And I think it's totally <laughs> tongue in cheek. <laughs> yeah, must be. It is. Yeah, totally genetically engineered cars, right, Dixon? <laughs> right. This is almost as bad as a. Stop ne- it. Never mind. No, don't go there. <laughs> don't, don't you dare go there. <laughs> Thank you. Now this one is really a fraud. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, I would agree with you there. Okay. All right, Twiv two eight seven will be at iTunes and Twiv TV, and we love to get your questions and comments. Please send them to Twiv at Twiv TV. Matt Freeman is at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thank you very much. I uh, will see you at ASV in, uh, I'm pulling up my app right now, 22 days. Oh, my gosh. Maybe? Yeah. Goodness gracious. Pretty soon. Yep. That that Colorado cool. Springs? Yeah. Colorado State. Yeah, for Fort Collins. Fort Collins. Fort Collins, sorry. Fort 22 Collins. days away. Go download your ASV app now. Yeah, <laughs> we have an app this year. Thanks to Paula Trachtman. She got that all done. It's mm-hmm. cool. No, no abstract book this year. Finally. <laughs> Do you know how yeah. much it costs to print and mail that? This is an abstract. Ridiculous. Not as much as this fraud car, but... I'm interested <laughs> to see how that goes over this year. I'm sure it'll be great. It'll be great. You can download the PDF from the website if you still want it. Yeah. Right. That's a, con- that's a concession to the old timers, right? <laughs> you going to get the app, Kathy? I already have it. Very good. I got it the first day it came out. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, I, I think if that. anyone wants to make some money at ASV... Print out the PDF and, and sell it. it up at Kinko's and sell it out of the trunk <laughs> exactly. of the car. Exactly. <laughs> Do you think they would sell some? <laughs> I'm, I'm there, I guarantee you they would sell some. Absolutely. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Mm. And Alan Dubb can be found at turbidplaque.com. He's also Alan Dubb on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Bingo. Dick- <laughs> Bingo. I was just about to say we oh, should do more butt, Virology 101, though. <laughs> Very good. Bingo. Is that what you do? I haven't been to a bingo in ages. Wow. Dixon Day Palmier is at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Aren't you going to say something on the Don't bingo you have board? A tagline? Uh, I'm trying not to, as you a matter of fact. You just say you're welcome. Norwalk. <laughs> Norwalk. Safe crackers. All right, safe crackers, that's right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Bingo. <laughs>